Well, good morning again. Good to see you this morning. Can I ask you to turn in your Bible with me, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Just a couple of verses from that chapter, and then we'll go over again to Ephesians, chapter 6. Romans, chapter 8. And verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to to the will of God. And then over in our chapter that we've been studying, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, again, which is our text, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplications. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. The Lord will bless to us the reading of his holy word. Will you join with me, please, in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name and we come because we need to. We have great need of yourself and your grace every moment of every day. Without you, Lord Jesus, we can do utterly and absolutely nothing. We come to you with our need and with our neediness. We come, Lord, today. We know that there are many here who are hungry to hear a word from God. We all need to hear from you, Lord, today, and we would open our hearts before you, before your word, that your spirit will use it to minister and bring to us just the very message that we need. There are some, Lord, who are hurting today, carrying burdens, Lord, which perhaps they cannot share with anyone but yourself. And they too, Lord, need to hear from their God, from their loving Father, and from their tender shepherd. Lord, there is in all of us today, Lord, a sense of utter helplessness without you, Lord, or what are we? What can we do? We come before you, Lord, and we spread out, Lord, our, our nothingness, our emptiness, and pray, Lord, today that you will meet us in a very strange and unusual way as we listen to your word expounded in our hearing today. We ask again, as has already been asked, Lord, that you will send us your Holy Spirit. Grant unto us his grace. Grant unto us his wisdom. Grant unto us his power. Grant unto us his comfort. And that today, Lord, there will be something new and unusual done in our hearts and in this church for your glory and for our good, we pray in Jesus' name. The people of God said, Amen. We turn again our attention to this 18th verse of Ephesians chapter 6 this morning, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And if you have been with us, you'll know that we've been engaged in a series of studies in this portion of God's Word where the Apostle Paul is making very clear his concern, his care, his compassion for the believers at Ephesus, knowing as he does that both they and us find ourselves in a war zone whereby we are, wherein we are constantly under the assault of the powers of darkness headed up by Satan himself. And in his concern, Paul makes known to these believers and also to us that we do not stand on our own, we do not face this enemy by ourselves or in our own strength, 
nor can we have any hope to confront him with any hope of success by our own wisdom or by anything that is of the flesh. And Paul assures them and he assures us that this great enemy, this powerful foe that we face, can not only be resisted effectively, but can be overcome by the power that God himself grants to his people. And so he says to us, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And not only can we stand in the strength of God and overcome by that same strength, but we can stand in the supplies that the Lord has granted unto us, the whole armor of God. And we have looked one by one at the particulars of this armor, the breastplate, the belt, the helmet, the shield, and the sword. But then Paul isn't finished. If we are to continue on the analogy that Paul is drawing here between a soldier on the battlefield and us in our spiritual war zone, you'll know that the soldier not only needs strength, he not only needs supplies, but something is very important in warfare, and that is communications. And Paul urges the believers that they are to stay in touch that the lines of communications between them and the great captain of their salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, might be kept open, that they might avail themselves of that great contact that they have with the God who has saved them, with the Savior that has redeemed them. You know that in the communications, the soldier on the front of the line of the battle can make known what, what, what his situation is. He can also make requests for direction, for guidance, for orders, for supplies. And it is vital, therefore, that this line of communication be kept open. And so Paul is also carrying on here to tell us that we are to keep open the lines of communication with God in the midst of the battle. That we are to pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. We saw last week as we began what is really the series within the series on the great theme of prayer, which is no small subject in the entire Word of God and certainly not in the epistles written by Paul and Peter and John and others. But when we looked at that, we thought of how that prayer at the very bottom line is an indicator of spiritual life in the soul. We quoted the words of Luther and Matthew Henry and many others besides that it is just as impossible to find a living person who doesn't breathe as a true believer who doesn't pray. Prayer is the soul's vital breath, the Christian's native air. Behold, he prays was the indication that the Lord gave to Ananias that Saul of Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus had been truly converted to God. Behold, he is praying. It's not only an indicator of spiritual life, but prayer is indispensable to spiritual growth. If we are to find power to stand for God and to serve the Lord, if we are to find power to progress in holiness if we are to find within ourselves the produce that God wants us to bear, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This can only be done as we learn and we need to learn again and again to avail ourselves of the great access that we have to the throne of grace and to pray. These things must be true. Prayer has to be the indicator of spiritual life. And it has to be indispensable to spiritual growth because both of these things are the work of the Holy Spirit. We are born of the Spirit, John's Gospel, chapter 3. And we grow by the power of the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that Holy Spirit who begets who commences divine life within us and continues to develop that, growth, that life and to enable us to grow in that life, that Holy Spirit is identified for us in the Old Testament prophecy of Zechariah as the spirit of supplications. 
And the evidence, therefore, that he has begun a work, and the evidence that he is continuing on in that work is that he will cause us to pray. He is the spirit of supplications. Brothers and sisters, we need to pray. We need to know how to pray. We need to cry out to God with the disciples of the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to pray. And we need to remember that above every other thing, that the house of the Lord is the house of prayer. My Father's house shall be called a house of prayer. And everything that else that goes on in the house of the Lord, whether it be preaching, whether it be sacraments, whether it be service, whether it be singing, everything has to be perfumed with the aroma and the fragrance of prayer. I know very well, as I have said all of that, that every one of us in this church this morning who name the name of Jesus Christ would have to confess that we are going to be honest with ourselves and honest before God is, this, is that we find prayer to be a struggle. Can you, can you acknowledge that today? Prayer is, is something that all of us battle with battle to do, battle to continue in. We find ourselves so, so, so often in a, in, a, in a frame of mind and in a frame of heart where even to, to discipline ourselves to pray, well, it would be easier to raise the Titanic uh, than, than it would be to do that. When we come to pray, sometimes the very thoughts seem to freeze in our minds and the words freeze upon our lips. And we feel so often assaulted as we pray with the distractions of the things of life. And to continue on to lay hold upon God seems to us to be something that is not only difficult but almost well nigh impossible. And that's why we have the encouraging words of Romans chapter 8. We are not left on our own when it comes to prayer. Well, that's why Paul says to these believers in, in Rome, he says that the Spirit helps our infirmities. And especially he helps our infirmity when it comes to this matter of prayer. And that's why again, when we looked at this, this verse last week in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, where we said on that occasion it's a, it's a text of Scripture that brings into it Almost in two sentences, so many aspects of this whole subject of prayer, the seasons of prayer, the sorts of prayer, the struggles of prayer. But it also brings before us the spirit of prayer. We are commanded to pray in verse 18, in the spirit, or in the words of the writer of the epistle of Jude in verse 20, that we are to pray in the Holy Ghost. You ask yourself, you ask me this morning, what exactly does that mean to pray in the Holy Ghost? Is this some special kind of praying? Something that is unusual and separated from ordinary praying? No, it's not actually praying in the Spirit is the only kind of real praying that exists. We cannot pray at all apart from the Holy Spirit of God. And so I want this morning to focus our minds and our hearts upon this subject this morning of prayer in the Holy Spirit. What it means to pray in the Spirit. Or if you like, we're going to look at three ways in which the Holy Spirit of God, as the Spirit of supplication, works in the life of the believer in this regard. And I think the first thing we can say this morning is this, that it is the Holy Spirit who stirs prayer in our hearts. That is to say, it is the Holy Spirit who prompts us to pray, who arouses within the soul the desire to approach God in prayer. Because after all, let's remember that that essentially is what prayer is. It is the approach of the soul unto God himself. The hymn writer, I think it was John Newton, penned it very well when he said, Approach my soul, the mercy seat where Jesus answers prayer. 
That's what we're doing when we come to pray. We're, we're approaching God. We're, we're entering into the courts of God. We're drawing near, to use the words of Scripture, to God. Let us draw near, the writer to the Hebrews said, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And to quote the book of Hebrews again, we are coming boldly to the throne of grace. We are entering into the courts of God, or to use the language of the epistle to the Hebrews again, we are entering into the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus. This is what prayer is, and it is the Holy Spirit who stirs in our hearts the very desire to do that. Let me emphasize again something that I just mentioned in passing there. I said that prayer was something that was aroused, awakened, stirred in the soul. It was the desire of the heart to approach God. And I want to emphasize and underline that, that prayer is a matter of the heart. Prayer is a matter of the desires of the soul. The Shorter Catechism asks the question, what is prayer? And it begins its definition with these words. Prayer is the offering up of our desires to God. The offering, the offering up of our desires to God. There's a little chorus that I think has fallen out of use among Christians today. It goes something like this. I often say my prayers... But do I ever pray? And do the wishes of my heart go with the words I say? <laughs> I may as well kneel down and worship gods of stone as offer to the living God a prayer of words alone. The hymn writer James Montgomery was asked on one occasion by a colleague and a minister of the gospel to write a poem about prayer. It's probably one of the best that exists in terms of how it defines what real prayer is. And it begins with these words, prayer is the soul's sincere desire. Notice the word again. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. John Bunyan, who we quoted last week, said again on the subject of prayer, he says, Better let your heart be without words than your words be without heart. In other words, all of these quotes in the Shorter Catechism by Bunyan and Montgomery and so on are emphasizing the fact that prayer is not merely a matter of saying words. The pagans do that. The heathen did that. They mutter their incantations. They, they repeat over and over again their, their little mantras. You remember how when Jesus himself addressed the subject of prayer, he said, when you pray, he says, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. You say, well, David, does, does, that, does that mean that we cannot merely repeat things like the Lord's Prayer? Uh, yes, of course we can. The Lord Jesus has taught us that we are to use those very words in prayer. But notice again what Jesus said. He didn't say use not repetition. He says use not vain repetition. In other words, even when I use the words of the Lord's Prayer, those words must be giving expression to the desire of my heart. When I say our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Is that truly what I am desiring, that God's name be hallowed? That his kingdom come, that it, his will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. That he might forgive my transgressions, that he might give me my daily bread. No, we're not simply to come into the presence of God and say words. It's easy to say words. And it doesn't matter how eloquent those words may sound. And it doesn't matter even how orthodox those words might be. Listen, if it's not coming from the heart, if it's not the expression of the desire of the soul, it is empty, it is vain, it's an insult to the God to whom we profess to come. Prayer 
is the offering up of our desires to God. Now this is a matter surely of great conviction. How often I say to myself, as I say to you, have I said, come ostensibly to pray and all that I said is words. And this great distance between what I'm actually saying and what I'm desiring in my heart as I come to God. I don't know if you've ever read Shakespeare. If you haven't, don't bother. <laughs> I had to do it at school. What an awful purgatory it was. <laughs> we had to learn the, the, the Shakespeare's play Hamlet. And there's a part, there's a place in Hamlet where he is, he's reading. And his friend says to him, what are you reading? And he says, words, words, words. In other words, what he was saying is that it's absolutely no meaning, just words. I wonder if we ask ourselves, is that true when we come to praise his words? How often have I done that? I have to confess, as you must, that that often has been the case. But you know, there's something else about this. It's not only a matter of conviction and reproof. There's a great deal of comfort here as well. Because as we take the flip side of that, it's possible to say words without heart. But thank God it's possible to have a heart even though we don't have words. We know not what we should pray for as we are. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 again. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings too deep for words. How encouraging is that? What a blessing it is to know that when I can't find the words, when I don't know what to say, when I hardly know what to ask, and that text of Scripture, as we'll see again in a minute, makes it clear that this is part of our infirmity. We don't know what to pray for. We don't know what to pray for as we ought. We are ignorant both as to the matter of prayer, what we should pray for, and we are ignorant as to the manner of prayer. We don't know how to pray as we ought to pray. But praise the Lord today, we're not left to ourselves. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. We've been born of the Spirit. He abides within us. And He stirs up within our souls desires towards our God. And even if we can't frame them with our lips and with our tongue, we know that that groaning that He affects, even if it's inaudible within our hearts, is a great work which he effects, which has mighty eloquence before the throne of God. Amen? Amen. You see, when I cannot find the words, let me just repeat it again in simple terms. When I cannot find the words, God sees, God reads, and God hears the desires, the longings of my heart. The Bible tells us God looks upon the heart. That's what he's looking at when we come to pray. When there's a longing after God, and the desire towards God, the desire to ask of God, the sense of that need that we have of God. Do you know, David said, you might want to note this reference, in Psalm 38 and verse 9, David said this, All my desire is before you. Notice that. My desire. All my desire is before you and my longing is not hid from you. Could I encourage you this morning as a believer? You've maybe sat in a prayer meeting and you've heard someone audibly pray and you've been impressed with their eloquence and their fervency and their knowledge of scripture and all the rest of it and suddenly the enemy has said to you, you could never pray like that. Don't open your mouth. I remember reading the, uh, and the biography of Robert Murray McShane, who was a young minister in Scotland in the 1800s, saw a revival in his church in Dundee, died at 29 of typhus. Young man whose holiness of life was an example to all around him. On one occasion he said this on the subject of prayer, he says, brethren, he was speaking to fellow ministers, Brethren, beware of trying to excel each other in expression. 
It's easy to do that prayer meeting where it becomes a fleshly thing where we're trying to outdo each other and how we can put our words together. What, a, what an odious offense that that must be to the Lord. Springs of pride of heart. God's not impressed. Brethren, he says, beware of trying to excel other in expressions. He says, remember the most spiritual prayer is the groaning that cannot be uttered. That's the most spiritual prayer. And if all you can say from a broken heart to the Lord is, Lord, help me, you make contact with the heart of God. Amen? What a great encouragement. For every believer who struggles to express himself in prayer. Not my eloquence, not my oratory. The longings of the soul. And those longings of soul, I say again, are begotten, are stirred, are the work of the Holy Spirit within every believer. And we are all conscious of that. We do truly know the Lord. As how often you have been in a situation or in a place where you have felt this strange impulse to pray. I, I, one of my great heroes, modern preachers, is the, the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And in his book, Preaching and Preachers, he said this, and, and this is well worth taking to heart. He says, above all, and this I regard as most important of all, he says, always respond to every impulse to pray. Always respond to every impulse to pray. The impulses to pray, he said, may come when you are reading or when you are battling with the text of Scripture. He said, I would make an absolute law of this. Always obey such an impulse. Where does it come from? It is the work of the Holy Spirit. Ever been maybe thinking on a, on, a, on a subject or been in, even in the midst of a, conver a conversation and you suddenly felt, I need to pray. Obey the impulse. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by putting it off. Obey it. That's the first thought this morning. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of prayer and to pray in the spirit is to recognize that he is the one who prompts who awakens, who stirs the heart to approach the throne of God. Secondly, not only does the Holy Spirit stir us to pray, the Holy Spirit shows us what to pray for. Remember again what we read in the uh, book of Romans 8, 26, we do not know what we should pray for. And we've often acknowledged and been in that position, we do not know what we should pray for. It is the Holy Spirit who shows us what to pray for. In other words, the Holy Spirit not only generates prayer in the heart, the Holy Spirit guides us when we come to pray. He directs us in our petition. And let me quote again uh, question 98 of the Shorter Catechism. Prayer is the offering up of our desires to God for things agreeable to his will. We offer up our desires to God for things agreeable to his will. And you must remember the words of John in his first epistle, chapter 5 and verse 14, where he says this. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. What a wonderful encouragement that is. But then that raises the question, how do I know his will? And that's, as I've said uh, Referring back again to, to, to what Paul said in Romans 8 and verse 26. This is, this is one of the great difficulties in prayer for us. Knowing the will of God. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. But once again we're not left in our ignorance. The Spirit of God does not leave us in that. He guides us in what to ask. And how does he guide us? He guides us by the word of God. That's why you'll often find the two things going hand in hand with script in Scripture. The Word and prayer. Prayer and the Word. The Word and prayer. 
You cannot really have one without the other because it is in the Word of God that all God's will for us is revealed. And remember, of course, that it is the Holy Spirit of God who is the author of this Word. We saw this when we looked at the sword, and he's called the sword of the Spirit. And it is the Spirit, therefore, who in this Word that he has inspired reveals to us the things that we need to pray for. He reveals to us our want, that means to say our lack, the things that we need. When we come to the Word of God, you cannot possibly come to the Word of God and read the Word of God without becoming aware, as you read that Word, that you, you need forgiveness because you've sinned. You, you, you need cleansing because your heart has been stained and polluted by sin. You need wisdom. You need, you need strength. You need protection. It is the Holy Spirit of God who through the Word of God reveals all of this to us. And those are the very things that we can put into prayer. Because the same Spirit who reveals our want reveals also the wealth that is available to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Where am I to find that forgiveness in Christ? Where am I to find that cleansing from Christ? Where am I to find that strength well, it's stored up for me in the Lord Jesus Christ? Where am I to find all needed grace? The Lord Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. And so the Holy Spirit, using the Word, shows us not only what I need, what I lack, what I want, but He also shows me where I can find the answer to all of that. The wealth, the abundance, the rich stores of grace that are found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so thus he shows me what is agreeable to the Word of God. How often in the Word of God am I commanded to seek these very things that I need? You say, well, can, is it as the Spirit of God that shows me my need of forgiveness in order that I might turn that into a prayer and seek that forgiveness? Absolutely. That's his work. He makes us aware of our sin. John's Gospel, the Spirit, when he has come, will re reprove, he will convict, he will convince the world of sin. Why does he do that? Why does he show us our sin as we bring our lives up against the standard of the Word of God? It's not to wallow in despair, it's to drive us to the throne of grace. Because it is at the throne of grace that we find mercy. And find grace to help in our time of need. And when I come to the Lord and I confess my sin and I ask forgiveness, I can be absolutely certain of this. I'm praying in the will of God. It's God's will for me that I confess. It's God's will for me that I acknowledge my sin. It's God's will for me that I seek his pardon. And remember again what John says. If I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. Praise his name. I cannot seek the forgiveness of God in vain because it is he who has bidden me seek his face for forgiveness and mercy and cleansing. What a wonderful promise that is. And then you remember something else that all of us are constantly brought by the Holy Spirit to feel our need of and that is wisdom. To know what to do. We feel like King Jehoshaphat when the enemy army invaded the land like a swarm of locusts. It seemed an impossible situation that defeat must be the inevitable result. And he goes before the Lord and listens to his prayer. Lord, we know not what to do. We don't know what to do. It's a good prayer. To acknowledge that with all honesty, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm at the wit's end. And you can think of circumstances of life and situations in which you find yourself constantly, daily almost. A hundred thousand little different ways you say, I don't know what to do. You know what the Bible says? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. God is actually giving to us the authority to come to him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I need wisdom. And when I'm asking for that wisdom upon the very authority of God's word, I'm asking in his will because he has told me to do this. Ask of God, he said. 
who gives to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given to him. The Holy Spirit makes me see how weak I am. But in the Lord I have righteousness and strength, the scripture says. And he bids me come in order that I might be strengthened with all might by his spirit in the inner man. So I look at the word of God and I discover that through that word, the Holy Spirit is making me aware of my wants, but he's also making me aware of the wealth that is available to me in the Lord Jesus Christ. Know that we can understand how much, how much is available to us in Christ. Brethren, we're like, we're like the infant paddling at the, in the seashore in the shallows and there's a great deep out there of grace that is available to us. And the God to whom we come in prayer. Listen, Paul has said this already in Ephesians. He said, he is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that you ask or even think. Beyond your wildest dreams. Beyond your most fantastic imaginations, God is able to do even more than that. And he says, come and ask me. Come into my presence and tell me all your burdens, all your fears, all your sorrows, all your struggles. Tell me of your need of forgiveness, of your need of mercy, of your need of strength, of your need of guidance, of your need of protection. Come to me for supplies. Come to me for everything. I love the way that John Newton put it again in one of his prayers. He says, you are coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such that none can ever ask too much. Amen? Amen. Too often, you see, and we all do this, we, we, we look at the circumstance and we measure the circumstance against our own weakness and our own foolishness and we say it's impossible it's the old David and Goliath story again isn't it and everyone trembled when, I, when Goliath roared because they measured a, a Goliath's strength against their own they said we could never overcome David had the wisdom to measure Goliath's strength against God's who is this Philistine, that he would defy the armies of the living God. We have a great God. And he makes available to us himself. He makes accessible to us his throne, which is a throne of grace. And he says, come. Come with confidence. Come with boldness. Come with the assurance not only that you are accepted in your person because the merits of Christ are yours, they've been imputed to you, they've been credited to you, you stand in him, you stand on that solid basis of acceptance which is the obedience and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are accepted and therefore your prayers are accepted. And when you ask in, in, in accordance with his will, he hears you. The eye of the Lord, the psalmist said, is upon the righteous. Who are the righteous? They are people who have no righteousness of their own, but they are made the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's you if you're a believer this morning. And the eye of the Lord is upon the righteous, and his ear is open to their prayer. Praise the Lord. And so we can come. He stirs our hearts the desires of our souls. He shows us from the word the things that we have need of and how those things are available to us and stored up for us in Jesus Christ. And could I just say this before I leave the point, that we do when we come to him, we pray not only for ourselves, but we pray for our fellow believers. And you'll see this again, how that Paul talked even here in this verse about making supplication for all the saints. And that goes beyond our little denominational boundaries, doesn't it? And that goes beyond our little, our little theological uh, circles. If they belong to Christ, they ought to be in my prayers. And indeed, we are given warrant in Scripture to pray not only for ourselves and pray for other believers, but we are to pray even for those who are unbelievers. 
Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, Paul said, is that they might be saved. And so for the soul that needs salvation and the soul that needs healing and the soul that needs strength and the soul that needs wisdom, where do I go? Where can I go? But to the Lord. The Holy Spirit stirs our hearts to pray. The Holy Spirit shows us what to pray for. And finally, the Holy Spirit strengthens us even as we pray. We know not what we should pray for. That's the matter of our praying. But we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That's the manner of our praying. It's not only a question of what should I pray for, but how should I pray. And here again, we are not left on our own. The Spirit helps our infirmity in prayer. And the question that you ask this morning is, how should I pray? Well, there are two things at least that the Bible indicates to us that should characterize us when we pray. One is faith. We are to pray in faith. James chapter 1 and verse 6. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, I will, said Paul, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Pray in faith. Now, let me try and, and, and head off a difficulty which is already arising in your mind, and it's this. What if I find my faith to be weak? Can I not pray until my faith is of a certain degree? Well, listen, remember this. Your faith and mine will never be perfect in this life. And if we are to wait until we are assured that our faith is perfect before we pray, we'll never pray. But the slightest mustard seed of faith, do you know what Jesus said? If your faith was as small as a mustard seed, you could move mountains. That's not a great deal of faith, is it? But the least degree of faith, praise the Lord this morning, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. It has worked in our hearts. And sometimes, sometimes our prayer can only be like that man who brought his demon-possessed boy to the Lord. And our prayer can be his. And I've used it often, <laughs> a lot. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And it is the Holy Spirit who works this in us. He gives us this measure of faith that enables us to approach God with our desires even with a trembling faith. A faith that was like that woman who had the issue of blood, you'll remember, who came behind Jesus in the midst of the crowd that thronged around him and stooped over and touched the border of his garment with her finger. That's that's the slightest contact you can make, isn't it? Just a touch. That was enough. Just one touch and the work was done. So I don't want you saying when I say that we ought to pray in faith that, you, that, that you'll turn your eyes in and say, oh, i got to work up, i got to conjure up. No, 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 no. If you're a believer at all this morning, you already have a measure of faith, even if it's a tiny measure. Enough for you to know this. I'm a needy soul. My God is an all-sufficient Savior. He has made a way for me to approach Him and to talk to Him. And weak as I am and trembling as I may be, I will venture into His courts. And you know when you do? You will not be driven away. You will not be treated as an unwelcome intruder. You will be back in closer by the hand of a loving Father. I, I, want, I want that thought to, 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 cut, to, cut, to control my thoughts with regard to prayer more and more, that, that when I come, I'm not only coming to a king, thank God I am the one who is sovereign over everything, but I'm coming to my Father. The story is told of, and I may have said it before, but I'm going to repeat it again. I started so I finished it. The days of Henry VIII, King of England, it was never a good idea 
to raise your head against the king. That was one way to lose your head, very literally. And there was a certain ambassador from another European court who had waited for weeks to have an appointment, an audience with the king. And one day he was granted that audience, and when he stood in the presence of Henry, a little boy ran into the audience room right up to the king's throne, and the king stopped speaking to the ambassador and turned his head and began to converse with the little boy. The ambassador was incensed. He turned to one of the courtiers and under his breath and he says, I wait for weeks to speak to his majesty and that child can just run into the throne room and speak to him. And the courtier says, be careful what you say. That child is the king's son. He can come into the presence of his father at any time. Dear child of God, you are the daughter, you are the son of the king. And he makes time for you. Yes, he rules over universes that our minds cannot possibly conceive of. All things are ordered by his power and upheld by that same power. And yet he bows down his ear to hear the cry of an infant child. What a privilege. We pray in faith. And we pray in fervency. You say, okay, and that stumbles me, David, for sometimes I feel so dull, so, so heartless when I pray. The word that is used in Scripture that's translated fervent has the idea of something that is hot or something that is boiling. And that comes back again to the thought of, of the desire of the soul. I'm coming to him with what he by his Holy Spirit has made me sense my need of. And so when I bring that desire to God, that, that desire in some measure have, has a fervency with it. And I can come and, and, and using the words of Scripture, I can pour out my soul to him. Haven't you often wished, I'm sure all of us have, at some point of our lives, that we could find some person that we could just pour out our soul to, just tell them everything. We have that in our God. I don't need to hold anything back from him. Tell me it all, he says. Come bring it all to me. Pour it all out. Psalm 62 and verse 8, pour out your hearts before him. And as it comes out, you know yourself when you've maybe bottled up something for a long time and eventually you get to the place where it, it, won't, it won't be contained anymore and you start, it starts to come out as you tell someone. It just all comes out in any kind of an order. All the emotion, all the thoughts, scattered as they may be. You know, that's wonderfully eloquent with your Heavenly Father. Tell me your sorrow. Tell me your struggle. Tell me your burden. Tell me your longings. Tell me your anguish. Tell me your grief. Just tell it all. Pour out your soul. That very, that very pouring out of the soul is a fervency which, which God will never deny. And all that in the midst of all of our struggle, remember again the context in which this particular text appears it's in the context of the war that we as believers find ourselves in how good it is to know that the line of communication has opened to the very throne of our god himself and we can tell him where we're at and we can tell him how we feel and we can tell him what we need and we can know that when we're telling him that he knows it better than we know and he's not only well able, but he is also willing to give to us just the very, very blessing that we need. Praise his name.